Hello, Facebooks, later YouTubes. Welcome to Deleted Scenes. Today we are fixing the lighting real quick. As much as we can fix it here in my office. And uh, we're going to be talking about repeated words in the Bible, in biblical uh, literature. Repeated words are a very important technique that the Bible will use. And this is something, if you take our Bible training class, we talk about this, about uh, the repetition of words in different places, um, and how if you want to get to the core of what a story is about, the main themes, very often what you want to do is you want to look at, um, you want to look at the most repeated words. And that will be a big clue uh, man, that light is in a, a terrible place, uh, isn't it? Let's go this way. This will be a little better. Um, how the repeated words <clears throat> will tell you the words. Sorry, the words that are repeated will show you what the important themes are. Now, unfortunately, we are we read the Bible unless you are very well educated and better educated than I am. Uh, which is not a big deal. I'm just saying I can't do this. Uh, you probably don't read the Bible in its original languages. When you pick up your Bible, it probably uh, is in English, which means it probably is a translation. This is the one. This is my preaching Bible. It is a uh, New International Version. Doesn't look like we want to focus on it. All right, and. Uh, that means I'm not actually dealing with the Hebrew words, and I wouldn't really know, uh, to be quite honest, I wouldn't know a ton of what to do with them if I was working with them. And you're probably in the same boat with me. And so there's only, there's only so much of this we can do, but I think it's interesting for us to know that this lies behind the stories that we're reading. And there are some ways that you can, you can track with, um, you can start to detect some of this in your Bible reading. So what do I mean by repeated words? Well, one of the words that you have heard me point out several times as we've been going through Jonah, if you've been listening to the sermons, is the word great. Um, and that word is, is used a lot of times in the book of Jonah, although in English it gets translated in different ways in different places. And so you don't necessarily see you don't necessarily see the repetitions, but if you were to pull up a um, a book that had, uh, here, this is called, sorry I didn't have this ready all, uh, before an interlinear Bible. This is what I would need to use, and what happens is you open it up and you flip to Jonah. Come on, too far. Minor prophets. You flip to Jonah, and you can look in here, and actually this one's already highlighted, um, but you'll notice that the text has English and Hebrew, and then these numbers that all the words in the Hebrew language, and uh, or in the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament, have been given numbers. They're called Strong's numbers. Um, and you can actually figure out which words are repeated. And so I've already highlighted all the instances of this word great. Um, and in Jonah, there is a, uh, this is, starts out, the city of Nineveh is great in verse 2. It says that the... Uh, um, there was a great storm. Let's see. Oh, there was a great wind and a great storm. And let's see that one. Uh, oh, the the uh, sailors are greatly afraid, and they uh they're greatly afraid twice actually and then of course there's the great fish and there's a the great city again in chapter three and there's the great city the great people um the king's great ones his nobles are his great ones there's jo uh when jonah 
uh, realizes that God's forgiving Nineveh. It's greatly uh, evil to him. And he's greatly joyful over the plant that gives him shade. So this repeated word, great, everything is big. It's, you know, it's like the, uh, the way we talk and we use the word awesome and everything is awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. We always talk about, we say things are awesome. Same thing in this book. Now, what I want to talk about today is a different word that gets repeated. This is a different theme word. And in Hebrew, the word is ra. And this word can, uh, it means, um, it's translated as evil or disaster. Um, it means, um, it, it, so it can mean either one. It, it means a bad thing. Okay. So a, a bad, it's either evil, like we, evil isn't quite right because um, it's, we, when we think of evil, we think of like intentional moral evil. And that's not quite what, raw, raw is more like bad things. Okay. So it can refer to doing bad things or it can refer to bad things that happen, but it's much closer to our word bad. And it's repeated a few times in the book of Jonah. And um, let me let me show you where it's used. So in Jonah chapter one, it when it says uh, go to Nineveh because its wickedness has risen up before me. That's the word raw. It's rawness. It's badness. The bad things they've done have risen up before me. Okay. So there's there's bad. There's raw. And then. In verse seven of chapter one, they refer to all of the. We, they refer to the danger that they're in, the storm, as raw. So who, they are asking, "Who's brought this rawness, this badness, this bad thing, this disaster upon us?" And then when you get into Jonah chapter three, they all the all the people turn away from their bad things, the bad things they've done. And then it says that when, when God sees that they have turned away from their raw, from their bad things that they've done, he relents from sending disaster. That's raw, bad. So it's, the same, it's actually the same word. They repent of their bad things. They turn away from their bad things. And God turns away from his bad things that he was going to do. Now, again, bad doesn't mean morally bad. God wasn't going to do something evil. But God was going to do something that they would be bad to them. You know, there were going to be bad consequences for them. Now, the reason why this is important is because the word raw occurs one more time in the story that we read yesterday in the sermon. It says in chapter four, verse six, then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. So here we actually get both of the key words in Jonah. We get, um, it, he's very happy. It says he's greatly happy. But also it says that the leafy plant comes to ease his discomfort. And that word is raw, to ease his badness. And here's here's the interesting thing. There's a couple things that we can notice from this. There's, there's a lot to say here. Number one is that, um, you could read that two ways, right? Number one is that it could, this could, this raw thing could refer to a disaster, a bad thing that has happened to Jonah, which is just the suffering of being out in the sun. It's hot and he's miserable and it's something that's happening to him. So it could be, we could translate it as disaster. But if you look, NIV doesn't have this, but the English Standard Version the English Standard Version is a little bit better for doing these word studies because if you follow the, there's a note, ESV has also translated it as discomfort, but there's a note there that says, or it could mean his evil. So what happens if we translate it as evil? Well, what that means is that Jonah has, uh, God is sending him comfort from his own evil. It is his uh, his. Um, anger, his selfishness, his self-centeredness, his own evil that is causing him to be suffering. You know, it is he is suffering from his own self-inflicted disaster, his own self-inflicted malice, and it's eating him up. And so when God sends the plant, he's again, it's just like how the fish, 
was saving Jonah from his own stubbornness. The plant is saving Jonah from his own malice, his own bitterness, really. And the interesting thing about Hebrew, because the word can mean either one, we don't actually have to choose which meaning the author intended. Because we do this in English all the time. It's called wordplay, where you use a word that has two different meanings, and either and both could work. And I think that in this case, we can read this as um, we can read this either way, or we can read this both ways to say that he is experiencing a disaster in a sense. He's experiencing discomfort. He is unhappy. He is he's hot. He's muggy. He's he's in the sand and the wind, and and you know it's just a miserable place to be. But why is he there? Well, he's there because of his own choices, his own bitterness that has brought him to a place of suffering. If he wasn't bitter, he could have been down in Nineveh celebrating with the people, having a cool drink of water. Or he could have been contentedly riding his camel or you know, walking back to Israel. But the reason why he is in that place suffering the way he is is because of his own evil or his own badness, bad choices that he has made. And I think that's really insightful as we look at our own situation, as our own situations. Very often we're quick to point the finger at God and say, God, why did you put me in here? Why am I suffering from these consequences? And very often things that happen to us are not because of our own, uh, our own uh, evil, bad choices we make. Sometimes bad things just happen to us because we live in a fallen world. But other times... I think just as often, the reason we are in these situations, the reason why we are suffering is because we have made bad choices. We end up in bad places because of bad choices, because of our bitterness or our anger or our stubbornness or our selfishness or our, our slave to our passions, all these different things about us that can lead us into really bad places. And too often, we point the finger at God uh, when really it's our own choices that have brought us there. I think the, the other thing that's interesting as you're reading this passage is it fits with this theme of what God, tend, what God does throughout the book. It, it underscores one more time this thing that God does that Jonah hates, which is that Jonah, or God relents and releases from Ra, from bad things. He frees people from bad things. So, for instance, he saved the sailors from the storm, which was a disaster, According to the um, according to the text, he saved Jonah from the storm, which was a disaster, which was a bad thing. He saved Nineveh from a bad thing, from a disaster, and now he is sending this plant to shield Jonah from his own self-imposed bad thing, uh, his self-imposed raw. And so it gives you just one more instance of this recurring theme in the Bible that God is the kind of God who delivers people from bad things. It doesn't mean he delivers us every time from every bad thing, but too often we think we look at the bad things that do happen and we say, well, God must not care about people. In reality, God is constantly shielding people from bad things that could have happened. And you'll so there are there are a few different circumstances that happen in a few different ways this happens. The sailors are shielded, are protected from a raw, from a disaster that has nothing to do with them. It's not their fault. They haven't done anything wrong. The Ninevites are shielded from a disaster that was their fault, but they repented and they turned away from their sin. And so God responded to that. And Jonah was protected from disaster, from a bad thing even though he was still in open rebellion against God, even though he is actively opposing God, the only reason he's sitting on that hill is because he's desperately hoping that God will change his mind or actually won't change his mind and will stick with the punishment that he gave. And the reason Jonah is so miserable is because he is so angry with God. And yet God still protects him from Ra. And that actually makes, gives me a, a thought that I'm going to track down real quick, and it just occurred to me, so I'm not ready, <laughs> so I haven't prepared this. I'm going to use, there's a website that I use called BibleStudyTools.com that lets me do word searches really quick, and I want to see if there is a, oh, uh oh I want to see if there is a, oh, not going to let me, 
there's a place. Okay, so what's what I'm going to have to do to check this out is I'm going to have to pull up my um, my interlinear Bible. I have to look up this verse. There is a verse in a famous passage in the book of Joel that we read on Ash Wednesday, and it's all about how when uh, telling the people to repent because God is the kind of God who responds and the response to repentance. And this is one of the places where uh, someone else other than Jonah quotes this formula that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And the last phrase of that in Joel, as well as Jonah, is he relents from sending disaster. And what I want to do is I want to see if what he says in there... Um, is the same word. He repents about evil, 7451. I think it might be. It is. It's the same word. So part of the formula of God, who God is, is he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents from sending disaster, bad things. He, re he relents from sending raw. And so what we see is we see this happening in the book of Jonah in multiple different ways, even his own self-imposed raw. I think that it's just such an incredible picture that we have of who God is in the book of Jonah. And it's so contrary to what we often hear and what, what has been preached from a lot of pulpits in the past. You may have studied in school a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It was a famous sermon from the uh, from the Puritans in New England uh, in the colonial era, uh, Jonathan Edwards, I believe. And it's just this very fire and brimstone, like God, it says God is, uh, it compares sinners to uh, spiders hanging on the end of a, of a thread. Like you are as disgusting to God as a spider would be if you were holding it by its own thread and you just want to drop it into the fire and that's how God feels about you. And the book of Jonah is just completely the opposite. Like in, in that sermon, Sinners in the Hands of the Anger God, and in, in that view of the gospel, God is it's almost like God is looking for any excuse to destroy you. And in reality, in the book of Jonah, we see that God is looking for every opportunity to protect you, every opportunity to show you mercy and compassion. It's just a completely different perspective on who God is. That's one of the reasons why I think Jonah is such a valuable book. And the interesting thing is, I've been preparing for my first Advent sermon today, and it's, it's actually, I didn't plan this out, but Jonah segues really well into Christmas because the idea of the Christmas season is that this is the kind of God that we serve, that, that because God is this kind of God, uh, it makes sense that he would send Jesus. It fits with his character that he is, Jesus is the ultimate way that he finds to protect us from uh, disaster, from our own bad choices and our own uh, bad actions. So I do have to say I'm very excited to be heading into Christmas. Uh, each Christmas season feels a little different for me. And this time I'm just super excited for all the decorations and stuff. Uh, a team came in and decorated the sanctuary this morning, and it looks great. And uh, I think in last week I told you I was going to be doing a series on the first chapter of every gospel, and I've decided to change that. Uh, you'll have to see. Uh, you'll have to tune in. Uh, come to church if you're local. Um, if not, you can watch live on YouTube. Uh, but we're going to be focusing on the Advent uh, themes, and I'm really excited. And also, we're going to be, uh, as part of our bulletin, we're going to be including some uh, weekly family devotionals. So you can download the sermon notes uh, from the uh, um, from the podcast page, or actually you'll be able to follow. There will be a, a page for devotions on our website, and you can do family devotions every week as we uh, go through Advent and with Christmas. So I'm, I'm really excited about the things that are going on for Christmas. We have um, Christmas movie night coming up this Friday. We have our uh, interactive nativity event that, uh, called One Starry Night that's going to be happening on the 13th. We have a Christmas carol, uh, a hymn, Christmas hymn sing that's happening on the 15th. And, of course, we've got our two Christmas Eve services that will be on December 24th. So there's lots of stuff going on for Christmas. We are excited to share this season with you. And uh, so I hope that I will uh, see you on Sunday. 
and uh, you'll be able to tune in next week for another Deleted Scenes. God bless, and happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>